Good afternoon. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this session, uh, which is called Infrastructure Update 2063. Uh, it is great to see so many of you uh, interested in this topic, and it is also my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, the esteemed panelists. I also wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Nena Stojilković. I'm the Vice President for Blended Finance and Partnerships in International Finance Corporation, private sector arm of the World Bank Group, with a very large presence here in Africa and a huge interest in infrastructure. Uh, for the next hour, um, we will be exploring uh, how, uh, what actually makes uh, some uh, large-scale and multi-country infrastructure projects work. Uh, we will be looking for uh, examples of best practice and successes, uh, and then we would also like to move forward and talk about what more would it take uh, to uh, uh, raise them to scale that we need to close the infrastructure gap in Africa, which is around uh, one uh, trillion dollars per year. Um, I would be particularly interested in the role of the private sector and uh, what would it take to bring more private sector solutions and private sector financing into infrastructure in Africa. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, my esteemed panelists and I will uh, briefly introduce them. Uh, from uh, on my left-hand side, uh, I would like to welcome uh, the President Museveni uh, of Uganda. Your Excellency, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Pleasure to have you here. Uh, next to him, uh, Mr. Patrick uh, Dlamini. Patrick, welcome. Uh, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of the Development Bank of South Africa, based in South Africa. Next to him, uh, Mr. Andrew Baldwin. Area Managing Partner, Europe, Middle East, India, and Africa, with Ernst & Young. Andrew, welcome. <laughs> Mr. Carlo Pone, Chief Executive Officer for Africa of ICOM in the United States. Carlos, welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, Mr. Thierry Dieu, Chief Executive Officer with Meridian Infrastructure from France. With that, uh, I would like to start uh, with my first question, uh, and it is the same question to each of my esteemed panelists. Um, Mr. President, uh, we would like to hear from your experience, uh, what were the examples of successful infrastructure projects, um, whether they were in your own country or in the region, and uh, what worked, especially uh, in terms of private sector engagement and multi-country uh, infrastructure projects? Well, uh, Chairperson, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I, I, however, would not like to single out only infrastructure as the crucial, as the only crucial element in developing and transforming Africa. In the last 55 years, when I have been watching the situation in Africa, I have found that taking one element and concentrating on it is not enough. Uh, we ha we have, I have seen uh, a cluster of about 10 bottlenecks that have really kept Africa behind. Infrastructure is one of them, is one of the bottlenecks. But there are other bottlenecks, like education. If the population is not uh, educated and skilled, then you also have the problem of the markets. One of the problems of Africa has been the fragmentation of the markets. Because when you produce, somebody must buy. And buy on a large scale and sustainably in order to encourage you to produce more. So therefore, having said that it's not just infrastructure, it is infrastructure plus, then I can, uh, of course, zero on infrastructure. Uh, remember, since some time ago, we said our, our economies would be developed and transformed by private sector-led growth. It is the private sector that will, will, will take the lead. But the private sector needs low costs of production. 
It needs low cost of electricity, low cost of transport, low cost of money. If it, if it doesn't have those, it will not make profit. They, they, will, they will lose. If the costs are, are very high, they, they will lose. Therefore, the, the good infrastructure projects uh, uh, are the ones which are, which are done but do not result in high costs for the private sector. Now, this is a little bit of a, con a contradiction because if a power station is done by the government, then the costs will be low. What you call tariff will be low, and that's what the private sector needs. However, if it is done by private sector, sometimes they are careless. They, 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 they build infrastructure using high cost of money, borrowed money, and then they try to recover it in, uh, through tariff, high tariff. Now, when you do that, then you are, you are defeating yourself. So therefore, I would advise the private sector. The, the private sector can, uh, if you build a dam, a dam will be operating for 100 years. So there's no need for you to be in a hurry to recover the money in, 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 in 10 years. You can recover your money in 20 years so that you, 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 you do not overload the tariff with the speed of trying to recover your money quickly. If you do that, then it will be a win-win situation. The private sector will contribute to infrastructure uh, but also the economy will develop. Because the, the economies of, of Africa need low cost inputs in order for them to be competitive. Otherwise, they will not be uh, competitive. That's what I would like to say mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. Thank you very much, uh, President Museveni. Uh, Patrick, um, from the Development Bank perspective, um, what is, what is your experience? Uh, what are some of the most successful uh, infrastructure projects that you've seen? Uh, we have undertaken quite a number of infrastructure projects across the continent. But I think the best example of them was the central corridor that actually His Excellency was very much actually part of the, of the core leadership. The central corridor was the corridor actually that links Tanzania from the Dar es Salaam seaport. Uh, it linked uh, uh, His Excellency's country, Uganda, Rwanda, as well as uh, the, the, the Bujumbura in terms of the, the, the what is the capital city is Bujumbura? Bujumbura. Burundi. Burundi. And, and what actually set this apart was the kind of political leadership that was provided by the five presidents who first sat together and said, the central corridor was critical for the five countries to be linked to the corridors of trade so that they could be able actually to be linked to the international markets. But then what they said was they then said to their ministers of transport that you will then come up with a legislative environment that is harmonized across the countries. You then make sure that there is an agency that is going to be responsible for driving the central corridor but what they agreed among themselves was if any of the ministers in any of the countries was not pulling his or her weight, she or he will be fired in the presence of the other presidents. Mm. They agreed on that one. You will be surprised how much energy was applied by the ministers, was applied by the technocrats in the transport departments across the five countries, and when we were to look for the information, because we also played our part in working with them, it was such a beautiful thing to see the harmonization and the standardization of processes to make sure that we're able to drive these projects. Because we had also put in the early project prep money into, in, in, into the project. It is still by far the best example that said on the continent, when you have the requisite political leadership, things can happen. Because this is what we need. When you look at the Agenda 2063, talking about the Africa we want, and talking about the PIDA projects, which is infrastructure 
on the continent, it can happen. But all it will take will be the foresight and the single-mindedness of the political leadership. Because when that environment is in place, all else is very easy actually to follow. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So political commitment and harmonized uh, approach to make multi-country projects happen. Um, Andrew, uh, Ernst and Young uh, has worked a lot, and you personally, on Africa. From your experience, uh, what makes things work in infrastructure here? Yeah, I think um, you know, we, um, we, we, we produce a number of global surveys around sort of global infrastructure investment. Uh, you know, clearly, Africa is competing with other regions for investment from, other, from various sources. Um, I think the great news for Africa is over the last you know, four or five years, our report and our latest ones out uh, today shows that Af Africa has consistently attracted a greater level of infrastructure investment. So this year, 2016, there's a 94 billion of foreign investment from, from the Western Europe, from the US, increasingly investment from China and Japan. Um, so you're seeing a diversification of the sources of investment coming into uh, Africa. Also, those projects are becoming larger projects rather than necessarily lots of smaller projects. I think the other positives I would take from our research and our report is you know, those, those areas of infrastructure investment are becoming more diversified. So historically, the investment was very concentrated on transport and in mining commodities. What we're seeing now is that infrastructure investment spreading into housing, is spreading into logistics, um, interesting areas around technology, which is looking quite exciting. And then also, also from a country point of view, you know, if you look historically, really um, Southern Africa, Kenya, Nigeria attracted much of that investment. We're now seeing a much more diversified set of investment opportunities across the continent, mm -hmm. so the Francophone area, the Western uh, African region as well. So you know, f from my point of view, looking at Africa, despite some of the cyclical economics that we've seen in the, in, on the continent, the fundamentals remain positive, remain strong. We're also seeing the growth being driven now, not just by you know, commodities, but also by the emergence of you know, a sort of a middle class in many of the countries, urbanization, uh, and also you know, infrastructure investment in its own right. So the report and the research shows that the, you know, the, the overall investment flows are increasing. So you know, we're very positive about um, the going forward position for Africa mm -hmm. from an infrastructure investment perspective. Uh, thank you for bringing that positive uh, perspective and also for um, uh, confirming that there is a scope for, for doing more in other countries, not just uh, focusing on a few a uh, few, few uh, um, I, I would say, more developed countries in Africa. That's very important. Uh, Carlos, um, you also work out of uh, South Africa, uh, or you're focused on, on, on preparation of, of, of projects. And can you just tell us from your experience what makes uh, those projects work? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> coming out from design, build, construction, and, and master planning, um, I, I think that um, uh, what you asked is that what, the, what and why does it work? And, uh, and there are a number of projects for many, many years that have, um, that um, were successful. So um, Patrick talked, um, talked about uh, East Africa and there are a number of projects in, in Southern Africa which, uh, which go back a long way and, uh, and all of them have a number of, um, of uh, KPIs um, that come all the time in common. So if you look at the, the Southern Africa power pool, so if we go back and, uh, and, uh, and we look that Southern Africa is interconnected on electricity, and, uh, and most countries in Southern Africa are connected, and, uh, and, uh, and why are they connected? There was an off-taker which was South Africa, and, uh, and there was a need from South Africa to take a, that electricity. And I go back to Patrick, there was a political will to, um, to bring power, uh, an interchange power uh, within those uh, within those countries. The projects made made sense. So uh, so that's uh, that's uh, an example. And we have got um, we have got in country examples. If you look at Mozambique, the Nakala uh, railway line in the and the Nakala corridor, there was uh, there was the Vale mine uh, where there are other investors in in coal. And that coal needed to go out um, of uh, of the Tete area. So between uh, between the private sector, government, and parastatals, um, there was an investment on that line to to export to export the coal. Again, finance was arranged 
there was a good master planning and there was uh, and there was demand and the same applies for the for the N4 Maputo uh, logistics corridor you had it on the road you had it on railway and um, and uh, and again it's got um, a number of years you got we got the private sector involved on the road we have got uh, governments involved on uh, on the on the master planning and uh, and the political will and uh, and uh, and the project made sense mm -hmm. so uh, so we see we see the same patterns all the time and uh, and that there is a good planning ahead uh, feasibility for the projects uh, good engineering capabilities on uh, on those uh, infrastructure projects and uh, and an off taker so if you have got those, you, you certainly will have success in doing either in-country uh, large infrastructure projects or cross-border on, uh, on inter-regional uh, projects. Mm -hmm. So three ingredients for success. Excellent. Uh, Thierry, um, you can react either to what you heard, uh, because you're also investing in infrastructure projects in Africa, or maybe give us your perspective uh, on what did you find uh, working here uh, and uh, maybe give us an example as well. I mean, b before I go to examples, I, I would say that I mean, I spend my daily job uh, convincing investors that they should invest in Africa and then deploying the capital that they entrust me with. And, uh, and, and I think we, we see it from a perspective of what is the perception of risk um, that investors have of, of Africa. And, and I would take four elements that are very key in that perception. One is political leadership and focus. Um, the second one would be the ability of the parties around between public and private to actually work together and, and partner together. So this is where blended finance has had a tremendous positive uh, impact on how investors have perceived um, projects in Africa. The, the third one would be, uh, you know, how sustainable are those projects and what's the impact, the long-term impact on communities, the economy, the long-term lasting impact. Uh, and I think that's quite uh, fundamental for, for investors. And finally, I would say well-prepared projects with all the good brains from both public and private sectors have always been successful. And I, and I would just mention two, um, they're mostly in the renewable uh, sector, but I think, you know, to praise South Africa, it's still by far the most successful scalable program that has been uh, implemented over the past five or 10 years. Uh, and that took a little bit of money from the EU, a lot of work from DBSA, and well-prepared project, you have a full-scale program and uh, attract a lot of investors and developers and actually deliver because you can bid a lot of things, but you also have to deliver. And that was a very good one. A another uh, sort of leadership example that I would take would be the one of Senegal when the president, uh, you know, going into COP21 decided that, you know, renewable energy was part of his SDG achievements, and uh, although there are many, many uh, solar projects that have been uh, sort of awarded for many years around, he decided to really shake up the, the, the tree and uh, get the uh, national utility to focus on signing uh, and, and f getting to finance with the private sector uh, the, the first few uh, pilot uh, PPA to deliver 30 megawatt solar plants. And, and since then, three or four have been delivered and that's getting scaled up, including with the IFC scaling solar program. So it's to me also about scalability and replicability of projects. Uh, thank you, Thierry. Uh, it's great to hear examples of success. I think that's a good reminder that we actually can um, design and prepare and then uh, finance uh, successful projects. I've heard uh, from most of the panelists uh, about the importance of political will. And, your ex and, and I wanted to also move a little bit into what more needs to happen to take uh, the development of Af in Africa to scale. And we're talking about infra here, but I really appreciate the infra plus because 
all the areas that you mentioned, Your Excellency, are very important. So I would uh, like again to start with you on what more can be done. Is, is, is there that political will that we are talking about in Africa? And um, will we have uh, the governments um, to do their, their own part of what it would take to scale up infrastructure? The, the political will has always been there because many of the African governments wanted to to succeed from the 1960s. However, the problem was what I call ideological meandering. Uh, one, one time, people will come with one element, say, oh, this is the most important, education. And then they talk about education alone. But there are many examples. If you educate people and they don't get jobs, mm -hmm. then what happens? Uh, then you get a crisis. And you find the people you have educated, they migrate. So I don't think the problem has been political will. The problem has been fragmented vision. Not knowing that you needed uh, not one factor, but a cluster of them. Uh, and I think that one, uh, there we can't go wrong. I think uh, even me, I have been watching for the last 50, <laughs> 54 years, either watching or, or actively involved. Uh, at one time, for instance, the African governments we are persecuting the private sector there was a phase in the 1960s when many of the African governments were, there was something called nationalization. Mm -hmm. Nationalization means you take over uh, private uh, assets because it was thought that this was uh, the b better way. But in so doing, you interfere with the, 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 the forces that could help you to, to, to create wealth produce goods and services. So it has not been so much political will, it has been more the problem of fragmented vision. Even the international agencies, the, the, the World Bank and so on, they also come with some uh, one, <laughs> one, one element. Mm -hmm. uh, women uh, something, <laughs> then tomorrow children uh, something. But, but now I'm very firm. Fortunately, I've been around for a long time. Uh, I'm no longer willing to listen to all this scattered thinking. <laughs> I am insisting that it must be uh, a package, mm -hmm. a, a, a package of about 10, for, for me, I call them bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has not been the problem of political will, because political will has been there, but uh, how, how to express that political will? in terms of strategy, the elements that are needed. Because Africa is very rich, we have got everything. Natural resources. In the past, the population was small. I don't know whether you, you also know that. One of the problems of Africa was a small population in a huge continent. Because remember, Africa is 12 million square miles. That's 12 times the size of India. However, even today, when our population has gone up, still we are still a bit fewer than the Indians, who are on only one, one twelfth of the land area of Africa. But that is, issue is being solved. The population is, 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 has grown now, and it is going to grow. So really now, I don't see what will stop us. I think for the first time, I think the, the way is very clear. Political will plus uh, a harmon um, a comprehensive vision. Let me call it comprehensive vision, rather than fragmented. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Your Excellency. That's exactly the word that I wrote here. Comprehensive solutions mm -hmm. are needed, not a piecemeal approach. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, especially when we talk about removing bottlenecks. No, thank you for that. Uh, Patrick, I will come last to you in this round because I do believe that we, development banks, 
have a role to play in packaging the solutions, uh, given who we are and what our focus is. And Andrew, I would like to get now your perspective on how do we remove the, the constraints? How do we uh, overcome them uh, in order for some of these projects um, uh, to happen faster, sooner, at a larger scale? And so, yes, so, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm you, changing the, get, no, no, I'll, go, I'll get to Carlos, Carlos as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I think when we, when we, if I think of the investors that we work with and we talk to, you know, the key things for them are around um, predictability and certainty, some of the points that Thierry sort of uh, you know, touched on, as well as then being able to have the mobility of resource and, and, and use and deploy the expertise. You know, frankly, a number of the projects we've been working on and advising on have, ha have hit difficulties around getting the right expertise into the country from you know, other countries or other markets where they've delivered those projects very, very successfully. I guess the other point for me would be around the pivot in where we're making some of these investments and you know, picking up the point from His Excellency around you know, taking a broader picture rather than a fragmented view. If I look at where a lot of the infrastructure investments going at the moment in Africa, you know, our data shows that less than 14% of the trade, the global trade within Africa is actually within Africa. Mm -hmm. Most of the trade is into and out of Africa to you know, either uh, commodities or products from China, the US, Europe. There is an in increasing opportunity, we believe, to drive trade within Africa. To facilitate that, it requires investment in infrastructure, which is cross-border. That's both the physical infrastructure um, around road, rail, et cetera, that we've touched on. But also, increasingly importantly, will be the digital infrastructure. And I think the real opportunity for Africa over the next 10, 20, 30 years is to sort of leapfrog some of the mistakes I think some other mm -hmm. areas of the world have made and jump straight to a, a promoting a more knowledge-based economy, particularly as they drive towards urbanization. Excellent. Thank you. Same question to Carlos. I think that um, uh, there are issues on the regulatory side and, uh, and what we see that needs to be bridged. Um, we have got inadequate uh, or absence of common standards across borders. Um, we have uh, competing agendas. Uh, on large projects, we might have a large, pro a large railway project that is fostered by one department competing on the same country with a road to do similar, uh, to, 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 to have a similar, similar end. So, so the competing agendas will have, will have to, um, to, uh, to disappear and, uh, and we need to close, close some of these gaps and I, I, I'm glad that um, that uh, President Museveni talked about uh, the coordination of the vision. Uh, many countries do have the vision, and I think in, um, in, in Uganda they're quite clear on the vision 2040 and what's, what it needs to be done, to be done into, into the country. But however, who coordinates this vision? Who does the master planning to the vision? Who makes sure that if there is a power plant somewhere um, uh, in the country, there is a road to get the coal there or to get the gas there. So, so planning and master and pre-planning and pre-master planning, it's uh, it's fundamental, um, you know, to, to, to the success of these um, uh, of these large uh, large projects. We have to. We also need to have a more coordinated approach across countries and uh, and um, and regions on uh, on the regulations that are needed. To make, uh, to make a successful project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Thierry, you said that you spend a lot of time convincing investors to come into some of those projects. So what more do you need? What would you would be telling us, um, different partners around this pl panel, what, what more we need to do to remove some of the constraints so that more investors can come in? I mean, I would only pick one in fact, out of all this, is anywhere where there was a strong administration capable of engaging with the private sector, you can, we made a success. And so, <laughs> and, and so the, the focus for me would be, I mean, we're talking about public infrastructure, and no public infrastructure can be developed without a strong administration. Uh, and, and when I was mentioning political will, it's, it's also administrative resilience and skill. And so my, my urgency would be to really promote the investment in real task force within administrations and within departments and well-coordinated one, obviously, focused on the priorities of the country 
that can deliver, which means it takes, you know, five to ten years to build up generations of project leaders, you know, chief engineers in departments. It looks old style, but that's really what you need. You don't need a lot of uh, money. You need actually uh, brain and, and leadership in technical, financial, legal skills within administration to be able to partner very well with, with the private sector because whenever an investor like ourselves, we are developers and long-term investor, if you take more than six months to engage with us, we move away to the next one. Uh, and there is a natural arbitrage in terms of uh, the attractiveness of engaging with an administration on a particular project up to, you know, from out the outset to delivery. And as soon as there is a little bit of a drag, a lack of focus, and the lack of real skills across the table, then um, people lose patience. And they, they have multiple opportunities, even in the emerging markets across the world, where they can go away. So that, that would be my, my big message. Excellent, and thank you for focusing on one thing, one important thing. Patrick, now uh, to close this round with you, uh, what can development banks do to support some of this uh, removal of constraints? We have a very strategic role to play uh, in this as the national development banks, together with actually the multilateral development banks, because we are able to come up with the risk capital that the private sector is not willing to, to put into the early uh, stage for the projects to be crystallized and to make sure that the economics of the projects are well crystallized and visible to the potential investors. So that we, one, it is that risk capital that we bring to the table together with also governments of the countries as well as the, the patient capital, which because of the limitation of the Basel III, that many commercial banks are no longer able to look into that one. So they look at the, the development banks and the multilateral development banks to say, can you be able to come in on the, on the long end of the project so that at least you make the project possible? Because when we are able to do that and we're able also then to attract the, 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 the trillions that are sitting with the pension funds, because those guys are not uh, willing to take the upfront risk and the construction risk of the projects. But once the project is, is operational and its cash flows are, are visible, then we are able to start actually then attracting the pension funds who need the stream of cash flows. So we are a serious unlocker or catalyst mm -hmm. of the projects as the development banks and the multilateral development banks. Mm -hmm. And can mobilize the rest of the private sector this funding for those projects. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. At this point, I would like to see where the energy of the room is, and I would like to go to you uh, on the floor. Um, you can ask, uh, first of all, please introduce yourself, um, and then you can ask a specific panelist, or, 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 or you, know, you can ask a general question, and then I will direct it to one of the panelists. So if someone can hopefully help me move the, the mic. Please, the lady in the first uh, row. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. I am not going to ask a question because I'm part of government. My name is Maite. I serve in President Zuma's cabinet. Uh, welcome to our uh, Excellency President Zavini, uh, my, uh, my hero, and to all of our uh, panelists. I say so because we were going to listen to our leaders here, in particular President Zavini and the panelists, and uh, my brother here, Danini, from Development Bank of Southern Africa, not South Africa, uh, to talk to us about infrastructure development. I learned from President Museveni that indeed we started by decolonizing Africa. Africa is unique because we first had to have an organization of African Union to decolonize the continent. Fifty years later we now have we have a roadmap. It's called Agenda Africa 
We met again in Johannesburg in 2015 at the African Union Summit to say this, we will have an implementation plan of 10 years at a time to check on these aspirations of the Africa we want. So I'm talking about infrastructure, planners, how confusing our governments are, and so on and so on, but we have one plan. We have one agenda. Of course, countries will have specifics. So please, let's also be honest and say, you are also competing yourselves for space. So if you keep asking us questions as we move further, but you don't say, we ask for this, you did that. We said we want democracy. Now you say democracy is too much. We want certainty. If you come to the African people are demonstrating, you say, oh, that's a problem. But years ago, you would have said, why are they not allowed to demonstrate? Public. So we have decolonized the continent. We have Agenda 2063. We said, Agenda 2063 is 50 years. We will ten, take 10 years chunks and we will have the aspirations of the Africa we want. We have this big continent. I proudly say, Your Excellency, I'm a mother of six children raising five. I'm saying I've contributed to this population we're talking about. Um, so we no longer have a problem of people. So we want infrastructure. We need, that's what we need now for intra trade so that our trade routes do no longer point francophone, anglophone, and this phone, another phone. If you live at uh, our trade routes, they were following the phony, phony, phonies of our colonization. We want intra trade so that our educated youth, I'm, I'm proud to say, uh, Your Excellency, of my my last born is still at high school. My four children, none of them has two degrees. They've got more than two degrees each. They want, they are educated. They want to be employed. They don't want to emigrate anywhere. They want to live here. They want to prosper in their continent. They are proudly African. So we must improve on infrastructure so that they can interchange we must also participate in this fourth industrialization, which is called digitization. Because industrialization has soon passed us. So the panelists should also be as assisting us as that as we intra-trade, as we fast track our infrastructure, how do we also make sure that digitization on ICT revolution does not soon pass us? so that we are part of this global community. If there are snap elections in the UK, it's democracy. If there is a party conference in a country called South Africa in 2017, it's a crisis. Can we call things by their rightful names so that we are able to solve the problems that we need to solve? When IMF and World Bank were created, they were never created to solve economic problems in developed countries. They were meant for us. Things have changed. We are part of the global community. Can we be allowed that space? And we can only fast track that if World Economic Forum also acknowledge that Africa is different in 2017. No, thank you very much. Thank you and for such a passionate statement. Um, we will get a reaction to it, um, but I would like to, to get a few more questions from the floor and then turn it to the panelists again. Yes, gentlemen, second row. Thank you very much. My name is Stumo Jamin, the president of the Congress of South African Trade Union. You can understand that for my question, good evening to the excellencies in front. My, my question follows a little bit from uh, my minister's question. 
because I believe that uh, even if we want to build uh, and develop uh, our infrastructure, we must be able to sustain and maintain it. And if we are conscious about that, we will therefore understand that it is possible to create sustainable decent jobs of skilled people, trained people who must sustain our infrastructure. But I observe that that's the area whether it is deliberate or it is by accident, we all continuously miss. Yet we all agree that for our economy and our economies to grow, you must have people working, you must have uh, people employed. Yet we fail to see that through maintenance of the infrastructure you are achieving number of things. Two of them is you having people on the jobs for a foreseeable time, but we are also having an infrastructure that we are using. We can update it through technology. Why are we failing to realize that? Where is the problem? That's the question. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Definitely, there is a, a big deficit, as you have said, as the panel have said, on the continent, uh, on the delivery of infrastructure. Uh, basically, that uh, there is no other development that can take place if uh, uh, that pass, part of the puzzle is not well articulated. Now, the challenges that you have spoken about, I want to ask to add more to the care of challenges or bottlenecks that the Excellency the President spoke about. One of those is actually the finance for infrastructure development. Where does it come from? Uh, I come from a country where uh, whenever government is trying to put up an infrastructure plant, then you have dissenting boys who somehow wants to put that, wants to use uh, the infrastructure. I, I, I now think about the road project. Uh, very nice but then they want to have them for free. And uh, uh, that is presenting a challenge in itself because someone must actually pay for this assets. Uh, the other one is uh, the, the, the regional projects. Uh, some of the times, even concluding the Nakala project itself between Mozambique and uh, Malawi was quite a hassle. It takes a long time to just basically negotiate between the two governments to have a common understanding and how the, you know, the, the, the benefits are going to be split between the two countries. By the way, this, uh, this, this thing takes off. You know, the, 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 all your financial models that you have done, they are out the window. You have to restart again and do another financial model. And the cost estimates, everything else has changed. So it, sometimes, and if we take it to the extreme, they become, you know, most of these projects become an, an ever-moving uh, target that they uh, really never we are never, we are never able to. And I'm sure in most of our countries we have those kind of projects that uh, we have been speaking about before our war. I'm only about uh, 48 years old. And uh, since I opened my eyes, we were talking about uh, uh, we were talking about the Inga and the Grand Inga. So those are the kind of things that I say. When are we ever going to uh, get a plan of planning for these things? Thank you very much. Um, uh, given the time, I, I actually wanted to uh, invite the panelists to react to some of your questions. I think it was important to link this to jobs and digitalization and co-creation of solutions. 
And um, I would like to start with Your Excellency again and uh, hear your reaction and we'll try to get briefly to all the panelists before we close. The, there are hardware problems and software problems. The hardware are if you don't have a railway line from inland to the ocean, which is cheap to transport goods, how would you compete? That's a hardware problem. It must be solved. The electricity must be there. The railways must be there. The, I would even uh, include education among the hardware, the skills. Then there's the software, which is the demanding the thing Andrew was talking yeah. about. The efficiency, efficiency, uh, corruption, those are software. But you must solve both. Even if you are efficient, but you don't have the rain, what are you going to do? With the efficiency. Uh, now, the, when I attend these meetings, uh, I see a lot of uh, lack of focus. Because you, you hear people talking of electricity in Africa. Only South Africa is producing about 44,000 megawatts of electricity. All the other African countries, very, very low levels of electricity. You take a small country in Europe called uh, Norway with about 3 million people. They generate 26,000 megawatts. Compare that with some of the big countries in Africa. How much electricity are they generating? So we should be serious. We should stop. It will be a miracle to see a continent which develops without electricity. The United States is a population of 320 million people. We are now 1.3 billion. The United States generates 1.5 million megawatts of electricity. All the rivers in Africa combined, including the Inga, I heard somebody talking about Inga, the potential, forget about the, the, the actual electricity, is, is not more than 360,000 megawatts. So even if all the hydro sites in Africa were developed, we would still be in energy deficiency deficit if we are serious about the development. Unless you say there is a new science which has shown that electricity. If that a science is there, then uh, I will stop talking about uh, uh, about electricity. So therefore, the, these funding agencies should be serious. They are not serious. I have been watching them. Shall we get the money to develop infrastructure? We should get it from ourselves. Pay less salaries so that we save money and we build the infrastructure. <clears throat> but if you pay yourself high salaries and you are squandering all the money, where will you? Uh, now, if we do that, then these, these agencies, maybe also they can come to, to help us. Now, regarding the, 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 the banks, one of their problems is, uh, I would call it frivolity. They are frivolous. They take small things, uh, tendering. W when you go for tendering, they bring all sorts of jokers. They, 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 they want a level ground field for tenderers. Uh, then the smaller one, when he doesn't win, he appeals. A project takes five years. To, to, to. Why can't you look for serious groups and they're the ones who tender? For, for, for business, instead of wasting time with these uh, 
with these jokers. We shall be democratic later, after we, in terms of business, after we have had some of the infrastructure. Now, trade, somebody was talking about trade. Trade is very crucial. Because if I, uh, uh, if I produce a, 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 a good or a service, but nobody buys it, how will I continue? So we need to be clear that we need the national market, we need the regional market, but we also need the international market. Because none of them is enough. If you say national, it's not enough. If you say regional, it's not enough. You must also have the access to the, into the international market. Uh, so I, I am happy to be here to, to because I've been watching all this for the last fifty something years, and, and my my ideas are now categorical. I, I no longer have any room for meandering because I, I have seen where the mistakes are coming from. Thank you for that. I will not have time to go to all the panelists, but I wanted to kind of different perspective. Thierry, anything to add from the private sector perspective now that we heard uh, President Museveni's uh, response? And then we'll try to close. <clears throat> yeah, I think two comments that I would make because um, we, we've heard a number of questions from, from South Africa. But South Africa, in a way, is very different from the rest of Africa. It pretty much has everything it needs to succeed in infrastructure, a capital market, very big institutions, very strong administration, a good development bank. And, uh, and so I think a lot of the comments we were making probably don't apply to South Africa, but apply to many other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It doesn't apply to Morocco either, but it's, it's about the sort of a very different category. My, my second comment will be on the digitalization. And I think it's, it's quite important that countries actually see in parallel um, the development in infrastructure with uh, digital economy and investment in SMEs. I think those things go hand to hand in hands and you cannot see one without the other. And when I was mentioning earlier, you know, impacting communities and the economy with infrastructure investment, it does mean that it's not just about building the roads, but it's also building the capacity on the industrial side and the SME side uh, that is uh, necessary to sustain the road over the long term, that is necessary, that is necessary to, uh, to actually have an asset in 30 years that is worth something. So uh, those things need to be seen from a fairly comprehensive way, and I think the private sector actually appreciates these overall integrated approaches in terms of risk management of, of long-term infrastructure investment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my own uh, take on, on what we've heard today is we are actually trying to co-create solutions uh, for the even greater scale. And that's how we actually uh, made the composition of this panel so that each of us has a role to play in taking things forward. I've heard um, a need for comprehensive solutions. Uh, I heard the need, a need for better coordination, um, removing bottlenecks, uh, again, in a comprehensive way uh, to bring more private sector financing to some of the most challenging markets here in, in Africa. We uh, reminded ourselves of the importance of political will, but also good preparation, project preparation um, uh, for sustainable uh, projects that will make, I think, you made the point, uh, sustainable impact on the economy. Um, we also uh, referenced de-risking and some of the new tools such as blended finance, uh, again, to structure those projects in a way that they are bankable and that, that we can bring the private players in. And I think uh, very important, given the topic of this panel, is harmonizing standards, uh, platform approach, um, and, and then making sure that some of these multi-country uh, projects for a greater trade and, and opportunities uh, within the continent itself actually can materialize. And I, I also think the leapfrogging by using uh, new technologies 
is going to be the name of the game in, in Africa. And would like to say, uh, as the moderator of this panel and representative of one of the largest financiers of the private sector in emerging markets, we are also learning our lessons and we are trying to turn around and, and, and change our approaches so that we can co-create uh, solutions for Africa with the governments, with project developers, with, with other partners, with other MDBs, and of course with the private sector itself. Uh, with that, I really thank you for your attention and your interest, and big thanks to my very special panel. Thank you for making time to be here with us today. Yeah.